Well, welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Mr. Nick Harper. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to have you aboard, man. Now, tell me a little bit about yourself and if you want what you do professionally. So, yeah, well, I just recently I got into, you know, podcast business, as you would say. I'm really just doing it to, you know, um, keep myself busy. And uh, it's called the Next Level Podcast is what I'm doing now. It's, um, you know, for a younger generation of athletes who are coming up, um, you know, through the ranks of sports. And I just have, you know, college, ath- uh, college athletes, professional athletes come on um, and kind of give their stories about how they, you know, got to the level they were at. Um, you know, I'm a big sports fan. I played college hockey, so I always wanted to, you know, help the next generation. So you always feel like um, a lot of people that really don't get the chance, you know, we talk about these superior athletes, especially through high school or through college. And I'm pretty sure we've all come encounter with it. Just either don't stick with it and it becoming a pro or how difficult it is to actually make it to the final, I guess, lap, you would say to become a pro. It feels like they just don't get enough attention. They just slip through the cracks a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And so I played a uh, division three and what I want, um, what I want to show, you know, those athletes is that not everyone goes D one into the pros. Like, you know I mean? Everyone, you know, has that goal growing up. Some people do accomplish it, but D three is more realistic for a lot of athletes or even like division two and like semi pro. And I just want to give, you know, all those options to, you know, athletes listening. Um, so they kind of know, um, what they're in for is not there's more than one like end goal it seems like um it's pretty difficult i mean they talk about the statistics of being a professional athlete if you're not like seven foot two you're not going to really get a basketball scholarship um it, right you know i i met kids i mean even in high school there was a kid in my uh, class named taheem that was like seven six and i mean but he could never dunk and I thought that was very weird that you're, you're so tall, you can't even dunk. Like I'm what five, eight, and I can still run and I can touch, I can touch rim. If I try hard enough, like it takes me a shot. Yeah. Sometimes I can, most of the time now I'd just swish a net, but still it's like, I got hops <laughs> for, you know, a short person, but I don't know what that is. Lower center of gravity, but you come across these athletes, these people that look like they're bred for the sport. And then they have something about them. that's not able to, I guess, meet up to par. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And um, a lot of uh, a lot of times, um, the difference between a Division two, II, Division three, and Division one athlete is a matter of two inches. Um, you know, my background being hockey, I've had a lot of guys who I played with who you know have a ton of skill, but you know they're five nine. And if you had the same skill set, you know you're five eight, five nine compared to someone who's six one, six two. You know, coaches just they're a lot of times going off of size. So it's well, just a matter of inches. Even when we talk about sports like um with hockey and all too, like that's a very rough one. I I've never really played besides street hockey, but ice hockey, I can't ice skate for shit. So I give you a lot of credit <laughs> on that one. Um I've yeah. seen my buddy was super interested into it. And I remember we took this trip one time up to like I think it was like two states over to the only ice rink that they have down there. And it was like all these guys in a locker room, you know, it's like a community type thing. And, you know, they all got their gear on and everything they have there on the ice and they're having fun with it. But they wrecked the shit out of each other. Like that is, oh, yeah. that is a tough ass sport. I was like, and then it, it caused me to look up the doc or the movie um, goon with Sean William Scott. That yep, is the yep. best fucking movie I have ever seen in my entire life because it literally is just beating the shit out of each other for the whole length of the movie. Yeah, man, absolutely. Yeah, it's a tough physical sport, and you gotta be, you know, you gotta be a little crazy to, to want to play it. <laughs> What's your worst experience doing this sport? Oh, that's a good question. So I was a goalie. So growing up, I um, you know, I didn't was I didn't get you know hit often, like you know physical, no, no fights or anything. But I definitely got a couple, um, you know, a couple shots like in the collarbone, um, in the knee. Luckily, I haven't had any you know serious injuries. I you know, just like a bruised collarbone, but like anytime you get a shot to the neck, um, you know, that's never fun. As far as worst experience, um, no, I'd probably have to say like, yeah, one of those countless times you get it in the the neck, lose your, uh, lose your breath a little bit. 
did you ever get um into any fights or into any like i mean that's a combative sport only because it, with anything that's physical football there's always tension even with your own team the fact is you got all that male testosterone in one room next thing you know somebody's swinging like for me one of the scariest sports was lacrosse because i watched a kid get hit with like an 80 mile an hour cross or lacrosse ball straight yeah. to his groin and even the cup didn't do much protection and oh, yeah, he no. got testicular torsion. So that scared the living shit out of me. Yeah, and I yikes. was like, I like my balls and all. But, I mean, you get that with anything, I guess you could say. Like, I played goalie for soccer for the longest time. And I stopped the day um, – actually, it was like the day after I played one of these games. And I went to slide up to go get the ball. And I slid legs first with my legs wide open. And a person, I mean – we talk about the kids in school. They're like, that guy's, that guy's a tremendous athlete. I want him on my team. He's the first pick. Straight up, I mean, not even a foot away, just punted it as hard as he could, and the ball went right into my nuts, dude. And I've never – like, I, I, I was shocked. I stood up. I was like, I think I'm okay. And I went to take a step, and then you just feel the sharp pain in one of your, like, testicles. And I was like, Ugh, and just fell to the ground. And, dude, I had to go to the bathroom and check. I thought something popped. Yeah, man, that's a uh, it's scary. I, yeah, I've had a fair share of those too. You know, even with the you know, with the cup, it's still definitely not fun experience. Do not recommend that happen to to anyone. Even when we talk about like, um, have you ever came across uh, maybe not yourself, but somebody else with a severe injury, like while you're playing or something? Like, um, I was kind of watching like a little league football game basically and I mean I wouldn't say by little league I mean like middle schoolers playing football yeah and there's a kid in my school um Aaron what happened was he did exactly what Joe Theismann did where his oh, legs okay. split like that I have never ever seen something so horrible in my entire life I think I mean I've seen people get killed before but that was something like just the amount of pain he was in and how people were trying to keep him from looking down at his leg and his leg which I mean he still doesn't walk right to this day it's been almost 15 something years yeah no I'm sure it's it's definitely you know got to be more scary seeing it in person rather than you see like the highlights of uh Theismann and even like Alex Smith when I happened to him but as far as for me, I've seen, um, you know, guys going into the boards a, f a funny way, similar with their legs, you know, tearing uh, ACLs or MCLs. Um, so definitely a lot of lower body injuries. Um, there, And then there's a handful of guys, you know, getting hit into the boards and you know that they just got their bell rung. Um, so their head, you know, probably possible concussions and you can tell they're out of it. And, um, you know, that's always scary to, uh, to see too. You always hope those guys are okay. You know, it's never, uh, most of the time, never intentional. You don't hit the guy to, to hurt him. You hit him just, to. Oh, you know, sometimes in, come on now. I mean, I, I was playing soccer and one dude shoved me one time and I was like, I'm going to wait till he gets the ball. I'm going to fucking slide tackle him or, you know, take his legs out from under <laughs> him or something. Oh yeah. There's some instances where you get, you know, a li little heated from, you know, whatever happened, but most of the time you don't want to, you know, hurt him. Yeah, exactly. Give him a well, severe at least it, injury. While we're recording, you don't want to say you want to hurt him. Off screen, right. We can talk about it. <laughs> but um, when we talk about like the world of sports, especially going on with what's happening in the world with the pandemic situation, what do you see is going to happen in like, when things start opening back up, when things start really kind of work, be able to come in contact with each other again, do you see sports changing? Because I just saw a post from Joe Rogan. He was doing the 249, I think, UFC, and there was nobody in the stands, and it was just the spectators and the fighters that were there. I was like, you know how that is a big play into a factor of how a match can go. Like, I'm oh, yeah. looking at how – Ticket prices, um, everything's going to be on pay-per-view. You're really going to have to pay for these fights. A lot of people are going to be Facebook Live in it. But at the same time, I'm looking at two fighters going up against each other, and you're talking about one fighter being in the ring and all the whole crowd's cheering his name and the other one's getting booed. That is in more likely of a favor of morale towards the fighter that is being cheered on. It's the same thing when you go to a football game. They tell you for, like, defense, make as much noise as possible so it throws them off, hopefully. And I'm like, yeah. what's going to happen if there's no fans in the bleachers? Right. And, yeah, so to answer your question, the you know, the major sports leagues as well as UFC and – you know, other leagues, um, when they come back, they're already saying, you know, no spectators. You got 
NASCAR has already came back. No spectators. Golf is coming back soon. No spectators. And eventually when the MLB season gets going and ho- and maybe when the NHL comes back, you know, they're leaning towards no spectators at first. So, you know, we're, I bet we're going to see that for as long as it takes, a couple months maybe. Those then, are the two easiest sports, though, to not have spectators. Like NASCAR, you're driving a freaking hell machine. You're going 200 miles an hour in a circle. You don't give a fuck if there's fans there or not. I mean, it might be awkward, but it's like you're practicing. And then golf is like yeah. – even the fans, when they do cheer, it's like like that little golf clap. So it's like I get that one to just help you more focus. But a game like football, a game mm-hmm. like UFC or baseball, when you hit that fucking crack and then there's a – you see that ball soar right over towards like the billboard or whatever, that is like the whole point of it. You get the guys copping on the thing like, next up we're going to do a free round of Chuck E. Cheese pizza if he hits a home run. <laughs> and everyone's like, you better hit that fucking home run. Yeah, you know, get some off their feet. Um, so I, I also think when I think of the spectators, I think of playoffs and how, like, home field, home ice advantage plays such a factor. You know, you're going into the postseason, and it's always like, all right, like, we got two games at home, two on the road, and then one, one, and one. So let's say you start on the road. All right, you win two games on the road. We got momentum coming back home in our building, in our arena, field, wherever. You know, it's just it carries momentum even more. You know, what I mean, coming home, no one's gonna want to come in your building when they're down two games of none. You know, fans are crazy, are loud, and loud and cheering. So I, you know, it, it just does play such a huge factor. And not seeing it, it's gonna be, it's gonna be different. But it's definitely, uh, you know, not something that really would benefit either team, I guess. Do you think sports are going to become more popular when this is all over? Do you think that since people are going to miss out on being able to go to the games? Because I think one of the most important things about sports is not only the family aspect of it and also the fun part of watching, you know, cheering on a team or something, the fandoms that go behind it, but also the experience of going to a game. Like if I was going to ask you what's one of your most memorable things, either in a game you played or a game that you went to with your family. So to – yeah, answer the first part. Um, I really don't know. I can see it either way. You know what I mean? Like, you got sport maniac fans who are like, okay, I, I need this. I, You know, I, I miss this so much. Can't wait to go to a live game. And I'm sure when they come back, you know, they're going to sell out for the first couple of weeks because people miss it. But then you have also kind of like the lower tier fans, as you would, that would watch something if it's on just because it's on. Or if they're like, well, you know, I don't – I made it this far without sports. Like, I don't really – I don't really need it. So I guess I can see it going both ways. But um, like as I recall, I remember I'm a New York Mets fan. So I remember going to, you know, Mets games with my families. Um, I'm about like four hours, four, five hours from the city. So I still remember like going to my first game, seeing Mike Piazza play. So like it's those memories that, you know, you remember. Um, so not, you know, not having fans, not having um, – opportunities to create those memories you know it's uh, very unfortunate to start hopefully after um we'll be able to get back to how it was my grandparents live about a half hour away from the baltimore ravens football stadium so we used to go there all the time and um you know when we go up and visit and it was always a fun experience but i remember the one that really sticks out in my mind was we watched this football game. We, it was, I mean, a lot longer than we thought. I think they went ended up going into overtime. They were against the Rams. And it was when Ray Lewis was still playing, so that was a big deal. And then I remember we're leaving, and we're stuck in the parking garage. And instead of staying and leaving a couple minutes early before the game's over, just we wanted to see the full thing play out, see what was going to happen, which you do in overtime. And we – got back to the car we're stuck in the parking lot or the parking garage we can't get out basically we're just all these cars are trying to get out people are literally doing the honking song where the two people will honk and a bunch of people going down the line will just start honking then everybody's honking it's like so much fun i'm probably 13 14 years old um and i remember being like i have to shit and my grandpa's up front in the driver's seat. My dad's in the passenger seat. My dad's screaming at me like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, really? Like, we just left. I asked you five times before we left. I'm like, I didn't have to go then. Yeah. And, my, and my brother's just sitting in the car like, this is ridiculous. And I remember my grandpa's like, just tell, let him get out and go. And I'm like, we're in a parking garage. He's like, get out and go. Be a man. I'm like, this is me. I open up the door, go in between a freaking, I think it was a Toyota and a Chrysler, and I just took a massive shit. I stared eye contact with this man 
there was a dude that was like sitting in his car, like doing the honky thing. He looked over and he's like, like just pause, deadpan, like a dog. Like when you stare at your dog, when he's taking a shit, I just dead stare at him. He looked away wow. and like kept trying to look over. But I remember that moment in particular. It got brought up like a month back. I was out to eat with my grandparents, which is not a great <laughs> place to bring up that story. But he goes, you remember that one time? And I'm like, yeah, I did do that. And he goes, dude, that was so badass. I was like, I'm glad you liked it because my dad was pretty upset. He goes, dude. <laughs> He goes, that was the one time I had toilet paper in my car. And I was like, right? That was like a perfect fit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's going to be my next question. Good thing, uh, you know, he was prepared. That would have been, that would have sucked if he wasn't. I really wanted to wait till that driver rolled up and was like, what the fuck? Like, damn, Baltimore, come on now. Yeah, right? <laughs> That's funny. That's <laughs> it's those can't say I ever did that though. It's those experiences you remember though, because that's like a good time in my mind. It wasn't fun at the time, obviously, but it was at those things you can look back and laugh on. And then if I had to ask you what would be a worst experience at a game, like for me, I went to a Orioles game with my grandma and it was probably one of my very first baseball games. I was probably like 15 or so. And um, I wasn't a big fan of baseball. Wasn't, you know, I'm not super into it, but I went there, they played, maybe 20 minutes of actual baseball barely got out of the first inning and then started to rain. And then they came back over with a tarp, covered it up, waited till it stopped probably 10, 15 minutes. And they did this about five or six times. Like we barely got out of the fourth inning. We had been there for three hours. I was eventually just oh, to my grandma. Wow. I was like, I want to go fucking home. This is miserable. Yeah. It's not worth it. Yeah. That's a rain. Like rain delays are always just so, it's so, so frustrating being a part of, especially, you know, if you're at a game for the first time or like, you know, you only get to go to one, two games a year and you go on a day where it rains. It's just so um, unfortunate uh, for me. Well, so yeah, like I took, like I mentioned earlier, I've been to a couple Mets games and uh, one time I, growing up, I was a huge Mike Piazza fan, but then there was one game where, um, you know, I went to my one game from the past like four years and I want to see Piazza play. And I remember just like sitting there, we got there early, just waiting, waiting for the lineups to come out, see the lineup posted and he's not playing. He's get he gets an off day so he can play the day game tomorrow. So I'm happy because I'm a Mets fan. I'm there, but then I'm just still like a little sad, little miserable because my favorite player isn't playing. But then at the end of the game, they end up losing. It's the bottom of the ninth. They're down, I don't know, down by one or two runs or so. And it's two outs, and then Piazza comes on deck. So I'm like, okay, maybe I'll see him hit. Maybe he'll, you know, hit a home run, do something special. The guy in front of him, like, grounded into a double play or something and ended the game. So didn't get to see my favorite player that year. What would you consider to be the probably the most dangerous sport for the player? It seems like with all the CTE type I guess, information that's coming out. seems like that's probably the most dangerous. I mean, if you're considering also adding MMA into the mix, maybe, um, I, I consider that, that more of a little bit of a fight, not really like the traditional sport like football or soccer. Uh, sorry, man, can you repeat that question? You were kind of breaking up a little bit. The um, fact, like, what do you consider – I would say would be the most dangerous for the player? Would you consider it be football with the fact that CTE is becoming pretty popular? Um. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, football's one hockey. Um, hockey's definitely up there too, but not so much because of the fighting because fighting has definitely died down uh, in the past years, but it's just um, the amount of hits too. You know, football, you're getting hit every single play. And, you know, a lot of times it's in the head. They're trying to prevent that with all the, you know, targeted rules and everything, but it just, it happens. A lot of hits in the head. Um, hockey is, not as many hits, but I feel like the hits can be more intense. You're on skates, you're going, you know, going faster. Um, so I definitely, you know, definitely those two. I'm not a big like fighter fan of boxing, MMA or anything, but I'm sure that definitely plays its course as well. Um, especially because we're learning so much about CTE, like you mentioned, and the long-term effects it has. Um, you know, they're just trying to make you know, the contact sports as safe as possible while still allowing contact. So I would, I would say, you know, yeah, football and hockey would be my top two. Yeah, I would say the same thing here. I think hockey probably a little bit more because the padding is a little bit completely different than football. It seems like football looks a little bit softer. But if you look at maybe um, hockey, those helmets, dude, they're a lot smaller and they barely cover up a lot of that and it's more like plastic i mean if you look at a football helmet there's so much padding on the inside all around it but 
that brings up into a big problem with CTE. I remember I saw the documentary when I was doing this research paper for, uh, I think it was like my senior year or something. And they were talking about how your brain picture it like inside of your head, like you being inside of your car without wearing a seatbelt. So when you hit something from behind and it pushes you forward, you're basically slamming up against the front of your windshield and then coming back. So basically your brain has no seatbelt. So it's just rocking up and hitting the side walls inside your head. And I was mm -hmm. like, I can see that more in football because you're getting hit at different angles. But the fact is, if you get hit like a good, like a, a shot in football, if you take that and put that in hockey, if you get hit like that, you're fucked. You're, you're out for the game. You're breaking a shoulder. You're breaking something because you're going to hit that, and then you're going to hit ice. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, you know, they've been trying to prevent it. You see highlights of hits nowadays where, um, you know, guys will get 10 game suspensions, like multiple game suspensions. And you look back in the – not even like that long ago, even early 2000s, maybe 2010 to 2014, some of those hits that, you know, weren't even called as penalties – but they'd be 15, 20 games, um, you know, nowadays. So it's it's good to see that they're, you know, trying to prevent those injuries as much as possible because they're long-term effects. What would you say would be the worst sport for the audience member? To to watch, like live? Look, either to get hurt, I would say, because let oh, me tell you hurt? something. Baseball, bro, that is a savage game. So there's a maybe – like the minor leagues, I would say, like um, there's a team called the Shorebirds and you know, tickets are cheap. You bring like, I think there's like $1 ticket night where you bring in like a canned good or something. They donate it. You get like one. That's what I love to go to. But I remember I went with my dad one time and I mean, this was probably two years back or so. So probably when I was like 19 and you know, we're enjoying this game it was the sixth inning. Next thing I know, a foul ball hits freaking 60 year old woman whoosh, right to the face, dude. I was like, holy shit. And this woman wow. looked like she was dead. Ambulances came and everything. They got her free tickets and stuff. But, I mean, that game alone towards the end was like five or six people were getting hit. And then I think I went by myself one time, I'm not even a few months later. I just wanted to kill some time, thought it would be a good thing. It was like a Sunday. They had a midday game or something. I was like, oh, this is perfect. I don't have to wait till late at night. Drove up there. I saved somebody um, from being hit with a foul ball. Two girls. Two young oh, wow. ass girls. Their mom thanked me. And what happened was I've never caught a foul ball in my entire life. Never. And that was my dream. I was like, I'm going to go to one of these games. I'm going to get a foul ball. I don't know yeah. how it's going to happen. But so shorebirds aren't very popular. So there's open seats everywhere. So I'm like, there's no way I can easily chase after it and get it. So I'm sitting there and these two girls are in front of me. I'm like, I figures I get the one spot where there's people. So I'm watching this thing and a foul ball comes up and the girls are on their phone, Snapchat, Instagram, just scrolling through, oh, yeah. just looking through. I just literally, their heads are, I guess, kind of close by. I stuck my arm at like elbow, like between both of their heads and just caught this ball that almost hit this one girl in the face. And I grabbed it and I grabbed, but when I, when it hit, I forgot the force behind the ball, I would say. So when it cracked into my hands, I immediately threw it in the air because it hurts so bad and you start shaking your hand. Yeah. Freaking, next thing I know, the girl grabs it and I just see it and she goes to hand it to me. And I'm like, you keep it. I just saved your life. Consider that. And But the mom was trying to thank me the whole time. Like, oh my God, thank you so much. She wasn't even paying attention. I'm like, good thing I'm not on my phone right now because yeah. you get to see everybody's reaction when they're on their phone and you hear that crack of the bat. Everyone brings their head up. Like, what the, like, make yeah. sure they're not going to get hit. Sure. No, that's a, that's a cool story. That's one you'll, you always have. That's awesome to hear. Um, yeah. Well, like, you know, when you asked earlier, which sports are most dangerous, I think baseball is definitely because, you know, you got uh, foul balls spraying left and right. Um, I know at the major league level, they have, they're incorporating nets like pretty far down the foul lines that are pretty high up to, to eliminate that. Because one thing, like, you get a fly ball coming towards you. Like, sure, it's like it's, you know, when it comes down, you know, I'm sure it could hurt, but you kind of see it coming if you want to you get out of the way, you have time, rather than, you know, those just screaming liners, which sounds like the, the one that you caught. And, you know, and especially you're not paying attention. I think it can do some damage quick. So, especially in the minor league ballparks, so they don't have they don't have that netting. You know, it's just.
So well, yeah. what's, well, yeah, what's, even, um, what's even what's yeah. interesting with the whole like net factor too, is I went to a football game and when I was, um, I was sitting right behind the field goal line, there was a hole in a net one time. I mean, maybe the size of just enough for a football to get through. And I remember me and my dad were always joking like, Oh, field goals going up, up the nets going up, up, get ready to catch it, get ready to catch it through the hole. When you consider looking at uh, sports and all the things that they can add into it too, but I see why you do your podcast to really highlight the importance of, first of all, these roles that especially these kids are putting themselves out for, and they don't get paid a whole lot of money um, compared to a lot of these, uh, I guess, superstar athletes, I would say. I mean, some of them get like, you know, oh, we're going to give you $5 million. We're going to give you these types of stuff. Once you get to the professional level, you start getting paid, but even some of the ones that do a lot of the work, uh, even some of the linemen, I feel like they should get uh, at least like how we get like the pandemic bonus to some of the unemployment money or whatever. They should yeah. get something like that for the amount of CTE they might experience or might end up uh, kind of getting later down the road. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Um, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm a, fo- I'm a football fan. I'm not too familiar with the whole, you know, process, which is kind of why I'd like to start this podcast too, because I'm going to be, you know, phys ed teacher. I'm currently a coach. So it's good to get familiar with different sports and, you know, the pathways that, you know, some people take, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, you know, it's some, you know, some sports and positions, you definitely earn your money, I guess, more than, uh, not more than others, but you know, the, the takes you hit, it's kind of like the risks that, um, that you take when you decide you want to do this professionally and, uh, you know, make a living out of it. Well, coming even from a coach's perspective, what do you see are some of the things that you can probably fix with some of the sports out there? Maybe adding new rules or adding a new regulation or something. I believe like it's hard to say to fix football um, only because I do think the safety gear is an issue. I think that when you have them padded up like that, it gives them more strength and more confidence to hit somebody head on like Ed Reed, for instance. He used to get fined all the time for his helmet to helmet contact because that's how he would lay people out. He would duck his head down and head first right yeah. into you. And I'm like, when you back in the rugby days, when you were wearing those leather helmets, you weren't doing that shit because you knew you were going to hurt yourself just as much as the other person. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, one thing that um, that I like that we do at the baseball level, so I'm a junior varsity baseball coach, is all the pitch counts they keep from my high school all the way to, uh, sorry, from like modified to high school. So like from ages 13, 14, all the way to 18, you know, when you're at that age and you're 14, 15 years old, you don't need to be throwing 30 curveballs a game. You don't need to be doing that damage to your arm. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the pitch count because I, I'd rather save a player's like health and career than win a junior varsity baseball game. Like, yeah, it's nice to win. But if I'm in a situation where, like, you know, my team's up by run, down by run, I got my best pitcher on the mound, I'm not going to test his limits. If his arm is sore, I'm not going to have him throwing close to 90 pitches just so I can get a win on a Tuesday night. I'd rather let him enjoy the game, let him be able to throw and be healthy the next day rather than just win a junior varsity baseball game. I want them to enjoy the process, enjoy playing rather than – Okay, hey man, we got we won, but I'm I'm out the rest of the year. You no, know, maybe I need Tommy John. Like, no, I'd rather health and safety is 100 percent more important. Where do you think on the lines of participation trophies? I think that it's a little bit of bullshit. I don't think. I mean, I'm not saying like it's all about winning and losing. I just say it should be known if there's a winner and there's a loser. But it oh, also yeah. should be like, hey, if we lost, let's not cry about it. Let's work harder to be able to get. You know, so I because my little cousin does like the Pee Wee stuff, and I'll go to a game, and next thing I know, everybody's getting a trophy. And I'm like, when I was a kid, and they if they gave everybody a trophy at the end of the year or whatever, I didn't feel right. I was like, I don't deserve the pizza party. I don't deserve the ice cream. We didn't fucking do anything. Our team was terrible. Yeah, I mean, so I I agree with you know there needs to be a winner, needs to be a loser. Participation trophies are you know I I don't think should be a thing. However, I don't mind celebrating the end of the year like. I get, get all the boys together, all the girls together, um, just get the team together to celebrate what we accomplished, whether that's a, per, a undefeated season or we didn't win a game. You know, we went in, we practiced, practiced hard for a couple months straight, gave it our all on the field. Sure, we don't have any, we don't 
you know, I'm not giving you a piece of plastic. However, let's celebrate the time we had together and celebrate the hard work that we put in because no matter what the score was, you should be proud of that. However, when you get to the upper levels, winning and losing obviously matters because there's playoffs and, you know, everything. Um, like at the, when you get to the varsity levels of like high school and everything, you know, there's playoffs, sectionals, regionals, all the way to state. So, yeah, I mean, not a huge fan of participation trophies, but I do it, like acknowledge hard work. Yeah, I definitely think like if you're putting in the effort and everything, and I see you're trying, obviously we talk about people that have natural born talent, people that have this natural skill where they're going to be above superb athlete and you can train as hard as you want. You might not ever be able to catch them, but I think it's about doing the best that you feel like you possibly can do. Like I'd rather take a loss, but know that I tried my ass off to get, you know, a win. Like to me, that's like feels better on the car ride home or something. I'm like, well, you know, I fucking tried here. Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah, I, I gave it my all, and, you know, the end result wasn't what I wanted it to be. But, you know, there's going to be another time I gave it my all, and the end result is going to be what I want it to be. So, and that, that's how sports goes. You know, sometimes, you know, ball goes your way. Um, sometimes it doesn't. But, yeah, that's what just one thing that I like to acknowledge from my players is when they, um, you know, make that commitment to the team and try hard. Even taking that transition to doing a PE, what are you trying to, what, what, what grade level are we talking about here? Because like, I mean, for me, my, the worst I would see would be like middle school, just because of the idea that like, you get it, they're not in high school, so you don't have to take it super seriously. But also it's like, none of the teachers for me, in my middle school gave a shit. Like I got, I've seen kids get hit in the face with a foul ball playing like just regular baseball practice. And they just go to the nurse's office. The nurse is like, lie down. It's like, but my nose is broken. It's like, just lie down. You'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, I'll be certified from kindergarten to 12th grade. Um, you know, in a perfect world, I'd love to do elementary. I love working with elementary students. Um, kind of going along those lines of teachers you've had in the past. Um, I guess, you know, most of everyone can think of like a lazy PE teacher they've had, you know what I mean? And that's not like who I am. I don't like being lazy. I like to be there for students, for my athletes. Um, so really just, you know, give them a way to be active and, um, you know, you're sitting in school all day uh, for six hours, you're sitting down, um, not getting much activity. You know, I want PE to be that place where students can come to the gym or come outside, get away from schoolwork, kind of get their mind off of the work and just enjoy and, you know, play games with their with their classmates, not get, well, games, activities, exercises with their classmates. I think that's a prime importance too when it comes to even learning because the whole aspect, like kids get gym class, they have recess. I think it stops for me. It was like sixth grade, it stopped. And then like, that's the way to get their energy out there. How are they going to focus if they're so filled up with energy? You go to PE class. Like I remember my uh, junior and senior year, I had like basically three hours of PE. I had two back-to-back -back classes. And a lot of the time it was like just bullshit. Like, oh, we're going to shoot hoops. And then kids are just running around like on their phones or something. I'm like, why don't we do something like super fun? Like when we played flag football back in like elementary school, those types of things. I think that's a great way to, you know, hone in that passion for wanting to play sports like I mean for a lot of people it's, it's fun watching it I enjoy that aspect of it too um you know you can't beat a nice bowl of chili while watching football with some Tostitos chips or something crushed up in there but <laughs> at the same time like it's a prime importance especially in our education system because like it helps you I mean you have to have those moments you have to find those bonding experience with the team first of all I mean I remember the biggest thing was like changing in the locker room around other people that was scary as shit. Everybody's like got their underwear on still. No, I mean, hopefully you're not getting naked in just a regular PE class, but still it's a, it's an experience. You got to learn to find that connection with your friends. You got to learn to find that connection with just a teammate in general. I mean, I've had fights with people, um, uh, you know, that I didn't like on um, that were on my team, but I put all that shit aside. We're playing dodgeball. You're on my fucking team. Duck, dodge, duck, dip, dive, dodge. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And you know, going back to the levels of, you know, elementary, middle, and high school, you know, you, you need stru structure in all those levels, you know, maybe elementary, a little more structure. Um, but, you know, it's, it's true that you need it for all three, because, you know, high school, you get more freedom, but you, you got to have objectives for them to complete, unless you're going to have a handful of students who don't do anything. You know, there's, there's, students out there who don't enjoy PE, which is okay. I mean, you know, I didn't like some subjects in school, but you know, you just got to make it 
like available to them, make it realistic for them to get, you know, physical activity in and just provide options for them along with structure so that they can be successful during their PE block. I have one recommendation for you. If you become a PE teacher is take out the fucking pacer. Yeah, man. Uh, we, we have to do those. I understand you have to do them, but I popped a boner one time in the middle of a pacer. It's not my fault when you're at that age, like freshman year or something, you're, you know, you're jogging in those basketball shorts. That's too much mobility for anybody. Okay. <laughs> I made it to like seven and I was like, I'm going to sit down. The guy's like, you're, you're done already. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, dude, honestly, I'll just take the loss here. I'll take the hit. That's fine. Put that on my record. I don't care. But for a lot of people like uh gym's an uncomfortable time. Like you're saying, I mean, you're growing your, your hormones are raging or something, but you know, there's some kids that are out of shape that really can't, you know, keep up with everybody else but the pacer just seemed like a giant competition thing i get that it's needed but you know i know so many friends that were just so afraid like getting the most anxiety um because they were overweight and they were afraid that they were getting made fun of and i was like damn i was like that's something i never even thought about like just hearing like my one buddy who suffered from like severe depression he would just not go to school that day and he was just super afraid of even going to gym class in general trying his best to get out of it go lie down sick or something and hearing that experience i'm like i think that's also the fault of the gym teacher is the fact that you're not seeing this that's happening i mean he made it pretty freaking obvious and he would walk up to the teacher all the time and explain to him he's like oh stop complaining get in there it's like hang on a second. Let's, let's, let's try and make this a little bit more open for everybody. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the goal with phys ed, the objectives is to, you know, get physical activity and get exercise in because it's good for our bodies. Right. Is the pacer test the only exercise that tests our, you know, cardio? Absolutely not. It, what those New York state guideline tests are, um show is just improvement so that's what one thing that we try to tell the students i i personally i've never given a pacer before because i'm still in graduate school but you know we're, we're told to tell the students okay don't compare yourself to others in the class you have cross-country runners track runners in here you got good athletes and you got people who 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 aren't good athletes you know it's it's for Beginning of the school year, all right, I got 15 pacers. End of the school year, okay, I got 20. I improved. Is everyone going to look at it that way? Absolutely not. You get 20 pacers in class, someone gets 80. It, it, it's just it's it's a tough situation to you know put students in because of it, it's everyone's so judgmental. Everyone's so afraid that oh I'll, I finished last in my class, people are going to go around the school. Oh look, he finished here he couldn't do a pull-up he's gonna do it's just so it, it's such a judgmental area that it, it it really just all that judgmental that judgment needs to stop you know if that's why i wanted to be a coach and a teacher because when i see kids trying their best I, I don't really care what the end result is if you're pushing yourself trying to get better that's what we care about we don't care about the end number if you reach your goal great if you don't all right what are you going to change next time to reach it and there's people out there who just don't enjoy exercising and it's not the healthiest thing in the world, but I don't think we should force someone to run from goal line to goal line for an entire class period. I like fitness, but I don't like running. I'm not a big fan. I remember one time I was doing the pacer in like middle school and I thought a way for me to be able to go longer and push harder was if I thought that if I didn't make it to this number, somebody would kill a family member of mine. And then I made it like I was still 15 away. And I was like, fuck it. They're dying. Like, I'm not doing this shit anymore. Like, you just give up at that point. And I think what you say is pretty important. And I think that's definitely needed, especially like school is a difficult time, man. You don't really want to be there. And when you graduate, you think back on it like, oh, those were good fond memory. That's graduation goggles. You didn't really enjoy it. You still, if, if I put you back into school, um, either depending on your popularity, you're probably still not going to enjoy it. You just miss the certain good stuff of about it but I think that is a one of the things I've always kind of suggested is instead of giving kids these classes besides the basic fundamentals figure out what they're interested in and sign them up for those classes if you're telling me that you're really like you're interested in cars well let's get you in some automotive stuff let's get you in some engineering you're interested in woodshop if you're interested in greek mythology like i was back in the day well let's get you into some ancient greek classes because that's where you're going to see people excel is when they're super interested in shit yeah no i agree um 
you know, I'm back to, you know, I, en I enjoyed being in school because I enjoyed people around me. I enjoyed my teachers um, and I, I enjoyed learning. And no, there's not everyone out there like that that sees it that way. But in the district that I'm at right now, subbing, school is the only place for these kids to go, not all of them, but for some kids to go where they feel safe, where they have fun. They, they only, they get their meals from school. Sometimes they're like a break. You know, you don't want, these kids don't want to go home. They don't want to go home to abusive parents, guardians, siblings, whatever. School is where they feel safe. Their teacher is there for them. Um, they truly enjoy being there because they feel safe. So I think that is important as educators to understand that, yeah, okay, I might be having a tough day, but I'm not sure what this kid goes through every single day of his life when he gets off the bus at home. When he comes in here, I know he's happy because he's with a teacher who cares about him and classmates who care about him as well. So I think that is really important, again, for educators to see that sometimes school is just a safe place for students. As far as interests go, I agree, especially at the high school level where you, you see you have the group that goes off to college, you have a group that does like trade schools, and you have groups, military, going to workforce, you know, based off different interests. And I think that's a good point that put them in their interest. Um, however, you being a fitness fan, me being a fitness exercise sports fan, we know how important it is for our bodies to have exercise. So I think that's why physical education is so important. However, with PE, if we provide tons of options for the multiple ranges of students, like, okay, if you want to walk around the track for the 20 minutes, that's fine. You're still moving around, you know, burning calories, you know, getting exercise. And I think if we provide those options, I think you'll see more students, you know, not dreading going to class. I think um, with a lot of kids that suffer from depression, I think when we talk about fitness or anything, not even looking at it from the physical aspect, but the mental aspect, I've worked out every day for going on eight years. So when I work out, it's where my demons get released. And I know when I say demons, it sounds like, well, you got anger demons. No, they're just my, like, I'm a depressive person. I can be very, very, you know, that, that, that levels me out throughout the day when I feel that weight, when I feel that in my hand. And I know so many friends of mine that suffer from severe depression and go to drinking. I'm like, you have an outlet for your depression. Everybody who has it does. Everybody has something that they find peace, they find wholeness in, whether it's sports, whether it's fitness, whether it's making a fucking bike, whether it's making furniture from Ikea. I feel bad for you if that's your freaking outlet. But um, it's still, it's something that we all have something that can keep us away from these depressive states and these depressive times, and especially with COVID. I'm hoping that a lot of people here spending this time at home or something are trying to find a realization in themselves, trying to find a deeper clarity like, whoa, I've been working my ass off for a company for 20 something years and I have nothing for myself. So maybe let me start a business. Let me go after this venture plan that I've been trying to go after. I think this is a prime time to figure it out. I think, um, you know, the world's going to be a little bit different when we go back to it for a while, at least. I, I see it going back to normal just with people. The social distance thing is not going to last forever. But I think it's very important that when we do go back, when schools start opening up, we start fixing shit. There's a lot of holes. Like, we're in a leaky boat, and it's going down. And I think people like you that are going to be heading into – um, the school and the, you know, the education system and trying to do their best, like the way you've been telling me that you, how you want to implement things. I think that's prime importance because honestly, we've been doing the same shit for so long because it's lazy and it's a template and it works. And I would have had a lot more fun in school with a lot more of my teachers, but it gave two shits. Yeah. Well said. And, um, you know, as, as those outlets, you know, some people, like you said, some people have different ways of releasing stress some more healthier than others and you know it doesn't necessarily have to be exercise or weightlifting which I mean, it, it's my preference I, I enjoy going to the gym as well um, but for some people it's you know going home maybe cooking going home reading drawing painting you know and I think during this time people are finding those outlets and more now than ever because there's a lot of stressful situations going on right now and people need those um outlets to relieve stress um, some aren't available and some are so you know I'm glad you, you brought that up um, because sometimes you need to just sit back relax and do things that you enjoy doing yeah 
what do you see um, with your podcast? What are you trying to, when you typically talk to somebody, what do you, um, do you have a basic question line up to it? Or are you just trying to feel them out and trying to come at it from maybe an athlete or a coach perspective? So a little bit, just a combination of all that. I like to start kind of how they got involved in the sport. Um, and then what like youth hockey, youth baseball was like growing up for them. And then it's really important. We talk about, like the 13, the 16 year old range about what they did there. Cause a lot of times that it's not where you get recruited, but it's when you get on the path to recruitment It's what you do kind of like pre recruitment, like a formative um, moment. Yep. Yep. So it's like, okay, so I played travel ball here or, you know, I was preparing to play high school here. I was going to this showcase. Um, and I, I, I started this podcast because I had a pretty unique story and I know lots of college athletes have unique stories about how they got recruited. So it's, um, it's good for listeners to hear that there's many different options available because when you're at that age, if you're, you know, if you don't have an older brother or like older friends who have done the process, if you're 15 trying to play somewhere, you, you don't know really what to do. you like, oh, do I contact the coach? Do I go visit the school right now? Um, you know, I'm just trying to get ready for my next season. Should I be playing here? Should I be playing there? It's just, it's good for them to hear all these options that, okay, well, I'm not playing at the highest level now in this case, but maybe I can make my way towards that next year. You know, maybe I can enjoy my time at this level here and then, you know, see what happens. And then I also want to, um, you know, stress the importance of how much playing a college sport means to us. Like, I, I think I miss it every single day. I'm in contact with a bunch of my old teammates. I'm thankful for my coach. It really changed my life. And I know that's the case for a lot of other people. So I really want to stress that importance to, to, to motivate younger athletes even more to, you know, chase their dreams, I guess, to play a sport in college. I think that's uh, important. I mean, I'm, we talk about the bonding experience you get with your team, the overall memories. There's stuff that you'll look back on until your end of your eight. You're basically end of your years. I mean, you'll be older mm -hmm. sitting down and thinking about those bonding experiences, and you don't really truly appreciate it in the moment. But I think that is something that everyone needs to experience. I know um, when I have kids or if I ever have kids, I'm going to sign them up for something because even I did rec stuff. I mean, I was doing recreational games and little small leagues where you'd go into and then like, you know, you have pizza party after the ending of the tournament or whatever it was. It wasn't anything school related wise towards it, but they were great experiences, great bonding experiences. I had a lot of hot chicks that were on my team as well. So that was a fun <laughs> moment. It wasn't, wasn't good when I got hit in the nuts though, but I mean, still it was, <laughs> it was, it was a cool thing to learn. Like, you know, you got to see, you know a better experience people I thought I would never talk to in a million years that we ended up becoming friends with and stuff and you know to see how hard people would try the tips I mean I was a goalie so getting hit you know everything's getting kicked at you my hands would get stomped on with cleats mm -hmm. um you know it, your fingers are constantly getting jammed because people are kicking when you're going for the ball and all that and uh, so many people would come up and give me like you know that pat on the back or something like good job that was a great save and having that there especially and especially having like if you have a lucky enough to have a parent that is involved my dad stood behind the soccer net and would be like all right he's it's coming to the left it's coming to the left and then he mm -hmm. would give me that guidance and it made me feel like oh shit i gotta put on even better because i have somebody here watching me and i think that type of supportiveness either if it's from a parent from a coach is definitely needed and plays a giant factor into it all yeah no 100 percent. and yeah the bond you form with teammates is just unbreakable um, you know, at the travel and high school levels, you're with your teammates quite a bit. Like, you know, you walk through schools and everything. You see them in classes, um, you know, weekends. When you get to the college level, it's every single second of every day. You know, I mean, you're waking up, going, getting breakfast with each other, having class, workouts, practice, games, you know, dinners after practice, going out after games. Um, it's it's you see them you know every single day and you really just it's it's a, it's a family as cliche as that sounds you know it's a it's a family it's a strong bond that you create with those teammates and it's it's something that will last a lifetime I still talk to you know my buddies almost every single day 
Uh, and that's awesome, dude. I'm very fortunate for you being able to come out and do the podcast too and explain a little bit about this because I feel like when it comes into the world of sports, either you're a fan of it or you're not. And I feel like there's a lot of people that just don't really understand the importance of it as well, besides just watching a game, but also being able to play it. I mean, the fact is with COVID going on, it's, it makes it difficult. But I mean, there's people in my neighborhood that are finding ways to, you know, play tennis, be able to do something as long as they're following the rules and stuff. But they're realizing like, shit, we're not talking to people anymore. I actually like people. Now it's the fact is we're coming together. I think this is going to be a perfect time, especially for your podcast as well, to truly take off because people want to know about this type of stuff. People want to get interested in it. But like you were saying, we sometimes just don't have the guidance and the will to get, go out and do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, like I mentioned, I just want to, you know, encourage athletes because um, because it could be intimidating. You know, it could be intimidating to go to a tryout. It could be intimidating to – contact a coach uh, or go to like a showcase. So I just want to encourage the athletes to go ahead and try their best. Worst, worst it's going to happen that, you know, you get cut. You know, if, if someone someone laughs at you for, for you trying to make a team, for you trying to make it the next level, then, then shame on them. You shouldn't listen to, you know, those people who are bringing you down. You know what I mean? You should, you'll feel a lot better about yourself if you go give it your all and make it or not, at least you know, rather than kind of sitting back on the couch that weekend saying, oh, well, you know, what if? Well, man, I appreciate that. And, um, I mean, that's a great thing to end on, too. Uh, why don't you go ahead and promote your uh, podcast, man, promote anywhere people can find it, make sure they can look it up, and I'll make sure I put everything in the description as well. Yeah, absolutely, man. This was, this was great. I appreciate that. Um, so it's called The Next Level Podcast. Um, it's available on, I do it through Anchor. So it's on Anchor, it's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, um, along with a few other, uh, you know, distributors. Um, I have an Instagram page at Next Level Podcast, a Facebook group at Next Level Pod, and then my Twitter is at Coach Harper 96. And I post um, a lot about our interviews and shows on there as well. So. It's perfect. Thank you so much for listening to this episode out of the Blink Podcast and stay tuned for our next episode.